Hey everybody, hello, welcome to Thursday Tea Time Live. I think it's about the fourth fourth time is it we've done this. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm streaming live on YouTube and on Facebook, so this is why I will be flicking my eyes between the two of you. Um, and so it's been another week. This The, the weeks seem to be going really quickly. Um, Obviously, we're still in this mad time. I think someone described it as the quickest but also slowest time ever. It's like Groundhog Day, but then you can't believe the date, um, you know, as it, as, it, as everything develops. But it looks like there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel now, isn't there? We, and spring is springing. Um, if you're in the northern hemisphere anyway, if you're down in the south, uh, southern hemisphere, then I suppose you're about to go into your autumn and winter. Um but certainly here in the UK, we're starting to see a bit more sunshine, um, a few more, um, uh, well, the, the crocuses and the daffodils are starting to show, the snowdrops are out in force at the moment, so it's all very lovely. Um, so what have you been up to this week? I, I was going to share with you a few things. Um, one, let me just show you, because I this may not be of interest, but I have a new chair. Do you think it looks a bit like a throne no one else is going to give me one, are they? So I'm going to sit back in my, it's supposed to be a dining chair. It's far too nice for a dining room chair. I'd, throw, I'd uh, manage to spill something on it. But yeah, so I'm very impressed with that. Feeling very comfortable this week. Um, and I was going to tell you about things like, oh, well, I went on about the dig a lot last week. I did get around to watching it. Thank you so much to everybody who recommended it. Um, it was thoroughly enjoyable. Um, because it's not a story that I was, hi Vicky, hi Phil, because it's not a story that I was um, overly familiar with. I know about the Sutton Who hoard and the background to that, and obviously I've been to the British Museum and seen that. Um, didn't know anything about the story about how it was um, uh, discovered and what happened to it next. And I, I have no idea the accuracy of the the film, but it was thoroughly enjoyable, I have to say. I actually ended up watching two historical films over the weekend. The Dig, obviously, which I've just talked about, and Mary Queen of Scots. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen Mary Queen of Scots. Um, it's, I mean, <sighs> Elizabeth I is how I got into um history in the first place. If you were watching last week, which I know a few of you were, then you know that... I was sort of looking for a, a female kind of role model, if you like, as a young woman and got, got into Elizabeth that way. Anyway, obviously Mary Queen of Scots, a massive part of Elizabeth's story. So I decided to watch the film. I don't want to offend anybody. And I'm not, I'm not a stickler for absolute historical accuracy because I think historical drama has a fantastic place in getting people's interest um, pricked. And, and then they go up, hi, sir, dad. Oh, from Madrid. Oh, I'd like to be there. Um, and uh, I, um, yeah, so, I, I, and, and so, yes, historical drama, I think, has got such a big part to play in getting people interested in history. Um, I think my problem comes if something is totally changed, totally, totally, utterly changed. So something, a lot of um, the stories you see that are, uh, or threads that go through some of the historical drama can be irksome but I've noticed they are based on something that someone said hi Kate something that someone said um you know which so it's not proven but then again you know we're talking about history uh, this happened a long time ago we, we don't know as much as we like to think we know um uh, but there was things in the Mary Queen of Scots um film enjoyable though it was fabulous costumes um which uh yeah was starting to to great you know someone is a well-known womanizer um being being gay and and things like that and uh, but to be to be fair it was you know it was it was just a saturday night and i got to watch a film and it was nice but yeah the dig i really really enjoyed um and then i don't know if any of you noticed history in the news this week um the, the the one story I picked up on, and it's not traditionally historical news, I suppose, um, is the um, the landing of the I can't remember what it was called the in, no not the Endeavour the Perseverance I think um, uh, NASA thing 
whatever you call it, um, uh, <laughs> on Mars. And what I thought, so the, the, the link here, tenuous it may be, is that they're looking for signs of previous life there. And it just occurred to me that maybe in a hundred years time, historians will be talking about our history or some history based that's on Mars that we don't currently know about. So I, I, I thought that was interesting. Um, and yeah, so that's what I've been watching, uh, listening to in history at the moment. And then books I'm reading. What books are you reading at the moment? Anything good, historical, fact or fiction? I generally tend to err towards fact just because I'm, I'm always doing a lot of research uh, on, 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 on whatever I'm, you know, going to be doing something on. Um, and although I'd love the diversion of fiction, I end up feeling like I need to be reading something, um, factual. <laughs> so, and if you're tip, if you're like me, I'm typically reading about three books in real life. Well, I've got two physical books that I'm reading, one on Kindle and one on Audible. Is that nuts? So the one on Kindle is about uh, the anarchy. So Stephen and Matilda, those civil wars, um, I think they lasted about 19 years when um, King Stephen took the throne um, after, um, oh, I'll come back to you in a minute, Michael, that sounds good. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so, so, sorry, so we had this the civil wars between King Stephen and the, the would-be Queen Matilda. Anyway, I'm reading a book by Matt Lewis on um, that at the moment. Fascinating. Um, I've got the the book. I'm, I'm going to reach it, but it's going to be too far away. Um, uh, by Michael Grant on Cleopatra. So, and and I got into a conversation with somebody on here um, last week, didn't I, about Cleopatra? Um, and it seems. Uh, Cleopatra is a really good example of something that feels like it's too far away in, you know, her story is too far away in both distance and time to have any influence on us at the moment. But Cleopatra, just as an example, um, has been linked to sort of her story, her influence on the Roman Empire, obviously, with her relationship with Caesar and Mark Ant and, and then Mark Antony. That basically, the Roman Empire and, of course, then subsequently the Christian Church was so affected by the impact of Cleopatra that that's kind of how we get the sort of we don't want females in power. It's it's a bit awkward when that happens, sort of <laughs> sort of phenomena. And then look how that has has sort of just permeated and, and continued for like two thousand years on. Um, now, if any of you saw my story uh, on Instagram or Facebook yesterday, I promised that I would show you this book. Um, and it is, I don't know about you, but again, I love old books. I know the research in them is obviously going to be older and there's going to have been things that have happened since that, that inform newer writers. But this book apparently once belonged to Susan Kenner. <laughs> Susan Kenner, her book, well, I'm afraid it's not anymore, it's mine, but this was, this was, um, it was printed in 1944. So it's just, it's lovely, it's lovely and old. And it's about, I don't know if any of you recognize, or some of you will recognize um, the emblem on the front. This is Robert Dudley's uh, Bear and Staff. You'll see this um, on sign posts for roads in Warwickshire in the UK still by the way <laughs> it's a little side but what caught me was the names of the well, was a couple of things the names of the um the chapters so she's chaptered at uh, she's called um actually who's it by sorry Milton Waldman um and then the the chapter's names uh we've got Murder, accident, or suicide? Well, we know that's about Amy Robsart. Obviously, uh, Dudley's uh, wife who died in suspicious circumstances. And actually, her early death was probably one of the factors which meant that um, Elizabeth couldn't go on to marry Dudley because, you know, they were both effectively impl implicated in a potential murder or that someone was driven to suicide because of their actions. So, Anyway, but then the next two, this is what caught my eye because it um 
because they rhyme. <laughs> I'm that easily uh, um, impressed. Elizabeth disposes, Robert proposes. I thought that was a nice thing. Um, and also, I think I don't think I put the post on. I think I shared one of Gareth Russell's posts a week or so ago about Elizabeth's, um, sorry, about Robert Dudley's final letter to Elizabeth. So any of you who don't know Robert Lester, uh, Robert Lester, sorry, Robert Dudley, who was made Earl of Leicester during Elizabeth's reign, um, effectively, um, well, I, I believe that Elizabeth and Robert were, were truly in love and, and that circumstance and complicated circumstance meant that they couldn't marry. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that, one of the key pieces of evidence, I believe, is that there's this let there's a letter that she kept with her in a little casket by the side of her bed um and she, and it was the last letter that Robert Dudley had written to her he didn't know he was about to die she didn't know he was about to die and all she wrote on it was his last letter and actually in the um the back of this book um they've transcribe the the letter that he that he wrote and he'd been staying at Rycote which was um John Norris Sir John Norris's home um and um yeah he 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 signs off um it's quite sad it's obviously sad because it's his last letter but I humbly kiss your foot from your old lodging at Rycote this Thursday morning ready to take my journey and he was he was feeling ill he was ill at the time and um I believe he was somewhere I'm not exactly sure where Rycote was I should, probably should have looked that up um to take the water so it was it was believed you know if you went to somewhere like Bath or Droitwich um with these natural springs that the water had healing properties and you know many people still believe that today um and he was he was doing some sort of kind of recovery you know self-care type thing that's where he was and you know they I suppose expected him to get well and come home and he didn't hi Dan hi Han um Michael, 1066, you're reading The Year of the Conquest by David Howarth. Brilliant. Yeah, I, I'd like to get more into, um, in fact, I am going to get more into looking at the conquest. Um, and I'm interviewing um, Gareth Williams in a few weeks' time. Um, he is one of the curators at the British Museum. And there's a find um, which he's been looking at uh, I think it came up a couple of years ago, that seems to indicate far more uh, or far more uncertainty that when William uh, won at the Battle of um, Hastings, that he, so he, I think the Battle of Hastings, uh, Michael, you might be able to tell me, was it October, November time? And then, then William was crowned at Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day. And that actually that period, um, uh, wasn't as straightforward as we might think and and there's some evidence for that that's going to be um sorry for the plug but that's going to be in my patreon um club uh coming up so um hi david all the way from canada hi um so um yeah if you're interested in that I mean, i'll put um, small snippets out anyway probably on on here anyway october michael thank you so yeah so the battle of hastings was in october william of william the conqueror um uh or William of Normandy crowned on Christmas Day, so obviously the end of December. So it wasn't actually that quick, you know. He 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 didn't win at the Battle of Hastings and tottle off to Westminster and get and get anointed, which was obviously extremely important. That's the bit where man turns into God appoint, you know, God appointed man. It was a really, really important, but still remains a really, really important ceremony um for that. Now I've just mentioned um my patron you might have seen if you um uh, follow me here that um uh the uh i've put out like a, a short um video of matt lewis's talk from ludlow castle um fa fab um there's there's a short version of it as well on the lowest um patreon which is like five pounds a month um which you can do there's also jane seymour blog in there and any of you who are in my patreon um i'm going live in there tonight for a little 
little live uh, event for us all. Um, and then, and then, what am I working on? I, honestly, in a year where I've not been able to tour, um, I've still managed to find myself really, really busy, which is good, isn't it? I think, you know, these things, they're definitely sent to try us. And I have to say many times during, I'm going to say the year, but it's um, it's 2020 and continuing that, uh, that uh, yeah, it's been challenging. And sometimes I've just wished it's not happening, as I'm sure most people have. Uh, but it has prevented, presented, not prevented, presented some um, opportunities as well. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, I'm going to have some this, uh, on this day in British history videos um, coming up. Could I do more on Richard III? Michael, I'm actually, well, uh, yes, I suppose so. <laughs> so at the moment, uh, I've got videos coming out which are sort of on this day in British history. You'll see all those on, on YouTube. Um, and I'm working on a monarchy series. So some of you will have heard me mention this before. Started off as a quick idea. Um, it's not good and then but I want to do it properly so it's not a quick thing to produce and it's a whole series on how each power transfer if you like happened so how we went from each monarch to the next beginning with Edward the Confessor so we cover 1066 the year of the three kings and um and continuing it's going to go right up to uh Elizabeth the second um hopefully I'll get it in time um anyway so yeah uh that's that's I'm working on that at the moment and I'm trying to uh, it's I want to do it properly so it's this is where I'm interviewing people like Gareth Williams um I'm gonna be interviewing um Gareth Russell I've, I've got quite um and Matt Lewis I've got quite a few people um historians coming in to help me you know really explore these um these power transitions which were rarely straightforward um even those that seem straightforward um aren't there's something else that went on you've got like the white ship tragedy which took the air of um henry the first and it, it just um well obviously that that then led to stephen and matilda so that wasn't that wasn't straightforward at all um but yeah so so it, it's really interesting i'm trying to do it with pace and properly so that I can start getting that filmed and get that out. Um, and so, Michael, to answer your question in a very roundabout way, Richard III will obviously be in there as well. Matthew Lewis will be helping me out with that um, particular episode. Um, yeah, because Richard III, interesting, interesting character. Well, the whole, name me a time period that wasn't interesting. Every time I think, oh, you know, the Plantagenets, that was very interesting. And the, the, uh, the Wars of the Roses, that was very interesting. The Tudors, that was very interesting. It's all interesting. It's all very, very interesting. And what I like to do and what I've done, hopefully, on these on this day in history, um, British history videos as well, is even though they're quite short because I wanted to get stuff over quickly, um, there's lots of really in-depth stuff on the internet, but this is... Um, more to introduce people to um, uh, to history, but if I found something that challenges sort of the received history, it's called so the things that we assume from um, from what we're told, if you like, or how we learn it. If I find something that will make you think a slightly different way, I will always have put it in. So please do check out those videos on on YouTube if you haven't already. Um, um, what else have I got going? Oh, I've just I, I can't, I don't think I can tell you which book I've just reviewed, but I've just read um, the, the the draft version, if you like, of um, of a, actually a historical fiction book. There you go. There's me telling you I don't read historical fiction, but I've just reviewed um, one by a fantastic uh, historian. And I have to say the way she has weaved in the history into it's actually a Mary Queen of Scots based uh, well time period based story um the way she has weaved in historical uh I'm gonna say facts but um interesting uh, just, uh, like things that are happening how would actual real life Tudors you know living at the time and all of that is weaved into the story and it's absolutely incredible so it's for me it was it's a fab balance between a story and actual historical you know, 
fact and the setting being correct. And as soon as I can tell you what that book is and who it's by, I absolutely shall. Um, so I've been doing that as well. And I've got a Kenilworth um, virtual, Kenilworth Castle, Kenilworth Castle virtual tour um, coming up for, for somebody soon, um, which I'm doing as a sort of private online talks. Obviously, with not being able to uh, get feet on the ground, I've had to pivot. Is that, that's what everyone says in the businesses have been pivoting um basically going online with some tours uh to uh while I can't do them in real life but I'm really really hopeful um that we're going to get to um uh to to tour really quite soon so we shall see and while we can't though I don't know if any of you follow me on um Instagram obviously some of you know me on Facebook and I, I share it there as well I'm I started sun, uh, Sunday uh, again, just an off the cuff kind of daydreaming about where I wanted to go. And I, I put a post on about the Tower of London. Anyway, I'm doing that daily now. And I thought, let's develop this a little bit. So it, it is suggesting, I suppose, places for, that people might want to go. It helps, um, I hope, people sort of think about the future and uh, and and visiting places but what I really want to do and what I'm interested if any of you know of any places is to uh promote if that's the right word um some of the smaller places we've got lots of independent heritage locations in the UK so obviously you've got the big ones like Tower of London Hampton Court Palace which have struggled because their running costs are huge as you'd imagine <laughs> they've got palaces and castles they don't come cheap um but we've also got, uh, but I think they're well known. So once visitors can come back, they're going to they're going to flood back. There's um, other independent places which I'm really keen to share. Um, so if you know of any, um, you know, please let me know. If you want to, either uh, you can DM me on um, on Facebook. Um, or you can email me office at britishhistorytours.com if you know of anywhere that you think I should, uh, you know, talk about. Um, uh, Kate, Wolf Hall for that reason. I like Wolf Hall for that reason. Yeah, that. so Hilary Mantle, who who wrote um, Wolf Hall, who, um, could I be, right, I didn't read the book because it, I, this right, on Audible, my books on Audible are the ones that are like that big in real life because, I can't quite bring myself to start such a huge book. Is that really bad? So I put them on Audible, so I don't know. So the Silk Roads, for instance, Peter Frankopan is uh, is on my um, uh, Audible, as is Cromwell um, by Dermot McCulloch. <laughs> and Wolf Hall was one that that would have happened with, except they made the film. So I watched the film. But yes, um, Hilary Mantel is, is, has been uh, praised for her, um, actually by Dermot McCulloch, um, for her... Um, her research and how she weaved in, you know, things into the story. So it's fiction, but it's, if any of you have just joined, it's not quite the Mary Queen of Scots um, film, which I, I have to say I was, I was uh, disappointed in. Uh, of course, they put the scene in with Elizabeth meeting Mary. Maybe, maybe it happened, but there's no evidence for it. Maybe there's some piece of evidence that somewhere... I'm just sipping my tea. I've been talking solidly for 24 minutes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. So, um, uh, yes, right. What else are people reading? Bulwell Lytton's novel, Harold, Last of the Saxon Kings, is great. It's written in Victorian English. Isn't it funny looking? So, I, anyone who's just joined me, I've been saying about this book that I've. Um, do you know, I've had this a while and only looked back through my um, uh, bookcase and, and found it. 1944, this was um, this was printed, which I always find it interesting when books were printed in the war. I, I think I had this perception that um, things stopped totally um, in the war. And in fact, this isn't the only book I've got that, that was... Um, that was published in the war. Another one I've got is about great the great... I can't remember exactly the title, Great British Cathedrals. So effectively it's, a, and it's written like a, a tourist book. So, you know, visit Peterborough Cathedral, visit, and it's got all the story behind it and hiya, Barbara. So it's, um, 
but yeah, so Michael makes a point on um, I hear on, on YouTube about the Victorian English and the English in this book, um, just, you know, the way that the narrative is written is different to how writers would write today. So it's like you get history layered with some more history, which is quite cool. I think maybe I'll read this and maybe I'll bring you some snippets out of it that I find um, because it's all, did I actually tell you the title of it? Maybe I didn't. It's sorry. It's called Elizabeth and Lester. It is just a book about Elizabeth and Robert Dudley, which is a fascinating topic for anyone who loves the Tudors and loves um, Elizabeth I particularly. So I'm probably going to bring you more out of that book when as I as I find it um but yeah as well if you if you um if you're not on Instagram or, or if you don't follow me on Instagram already please do come along and follow me there or um just give me some suggestions of places that you think we should help put on back on the map when everyone can um travel again um like I say independent places smaller places um so for instance even uh, last week I talked a lot about Ludlow Castle. I, I went off on one about Ludlow Castle because it's just fabulous. And um, that's an independent place. You know, that's privately owned. Um, Hever Castle, in fact, is privately owned. Um, but there's also much smaller places. I talked about the Jenner Museum. The irony of losing, you know, the, the Jenner Museum uh, after a pandemic would be... Uh, an evil irony really um you know it's places like that I think places like the Tower of London Hampton Court Palace will they should bounce back because people already know them they're on people's bucket list so I'm trying to use um my platform to raise the profile of some others that people might not know so much about also uh I'm recording a podcast with um Sarah Morris the Tudor travel guide next week I think it goes out the week after um, and um, it's her podcast and I go on each month to talk about some travel related um, things and um, next week yes yeah, so we're recording that next week and we're talking about places to go outside of London um, aimed at people who maybe have done London you know if you've come over to um, to the UK from elsewhere or Haddon Hall Barbara great yeah great suggestion Um I haven't been myself, so there you go. My bucket list is growing. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure what what I'm going to have time <laughs> or time to do. Um, I might just take a tent with me and go, I don't know, the equivalent of back, backpacking, but with a tent around the UK so I can get to some of these places. <laughs> um, uh, what was I saying? Someone remind me. Um, oh, yes, the podcast with Sarah. Um, yes, we're talking about going outside of London. So either if you've travelled to the UK, of course you're going to go and do London. I get that. But, but yeah, but outside of London is this whole other, you know, we've got a whole country outside of London, <laughs> loads of um, history and heritage everywhere. You've got more, you've got ruins you can go and um, and explore if you like that kind of thing. You've obviously got other um, castles and and uh, churches and cathedrals that, that you know all over the place um probably if you go you know I imagine people have done Stonehenge if they're going to do anything that kind of thing outside of London but if you're going to go and do Stonehenge go and do Old Sarum uh, or Sarum Sarum not sure how people say it um uh, uh which is which is an old the old um that uh, castle and the old Salisbury Cathedral site and you can actually look from the top of the site I'm, I'm getting okay I'm, I'm using my hands a lot um, you can look for down from old Sarum over the old cathedral site and still see and sorry and see the current cathedral uh in the background which floats I did a blog about that I don't think it's still live on my website maybe I'll, uh, I'll republish it um Michael says the north of England seems to have had so many dramatic events well absolutely so last week when we spoke about Ludlow I spoke about it being on the border and so there's there's lots of events on borders right and so the north of England on the border with Scotland um yeah I, I mean it massive amounts of, of drama um going on up, up there um and 
so you get some uh, really interesting castles in the north of England, um, uh, which had to be fortified because of just where they were. So you've got you know quite substantial um, castles. Um, I need to make it back up to the the north of England. It was it was due this year, or well last year. I'm still bulking it all together. I don't know if anyone else does that. I keep finding myself saying last year when really I just mean pre covid or whatever um obviously you've got hadrian's wall uh in the north of england york was where i was supposed to be going last easter um to go and explore the minster um yeah so that will that will have to be that that's back on my list of places to go corf castle is another one that's down in dorset um so yeah, have a look out on on my Instagram because I'll I'll be sharing these over the next um, few. Oh, Lincoln, Barbara, yeah. So York and Lincoln. I haven't made it to Lincoln either. Peterborough uh, was was a place that I was desperate to go. Obviously, to the cathedral. I spoke about that last week, which I managed at the start of twenty twenty. Um, I um, I also actually managed to go to Tewkesbury Abbey last year, and Hever Castle. I went. Um, uh, during one of the short periods where it was open and managed to do some filming again for um patreon if anybody wants to come and join me over there um yeah so there's there's it's going to be i think fab i think some people are going to need a little bit of encouragement to get back into traveling um but uh oh michael's well saying so many beautiful castles in shropshire yes there are do you know and a lot are, are in um private hands as well um, which we can't do anything about. Um, one of my concerns with the pandemic is that, or could be, is maybe still uh, that some of the places that we can currently go and visit, or you know, in normal times could go and visit, might end up being sold and go into private hands. That's that was one of my concerns. We'll have to see if that um, plays out. I hope I hope not. But yeah, um, and the reason I know there are some castles. Um, uh, Shropshire and Staffordshire actually the reason I know there's so many castles is my friend sent me a link to one yesterday that she wants to buy <laughs> it's got a moat it's got turrets yeah nice idea nice idea I'm not sure I'd like the running cost to be to be perfectly honest but uh, there was a ballroom and like I said turrets and a moat and I think there might have even been well there's definitely a cellar but yeah um what else have we got michael says a lot of his ancestors come from the scottish borders um they probably came down south to get away from the violence actually um my family on my mother's side um came from scotland and actually were part of the highland clearances which i i don't i admit no a whole lot about but basically um people were just ousted um th th they wanted the land for something else they, were, they, they and they were they were moved on and they my family went down to liverpool um and uh so yeah so so came sort of far enough into england to be away from the borders but uh but yeah originally scottish the name doherty is in my family name um so yeah well, thank you so much for joining me today again for Thursday tea time. I didn't get much of a sip of my tea. Hopefully you all did. Um, I've got Michael says Towton. There's so many places. Honestly, I, it, it, once you get out of London and realise how many places there are, I suppose the difficulty is the travel outside of um, outside of London. People get put off by um, how do you get around. And in fact, actually, that's that's part of what um what sarah wants to do on the tudor travel guide podcast um travel essentials she's called it so we're on there talking about um about how to get around if you want to get outside of london and i'll probably be talking about more about that on the next one as well um you know you can always hire me as well i have a car i actually bought a big car in order to do the tours for other people so um yeah <laughs> And then, and then 2020 happens. And the irony is I need new tyres. I haven't been anywhere. So never mind. Get that done. Get that done. 
So thank you all so much for joining me. Um, I will be back next Thursday for another Thursday Tea Time. And hopefully I'll see you in the meantime as well. Um, you can follow me on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. And, uh, and I'd love to uh, hear your thoughts about places that we can all get going to after this has gone and we all have... Um, and we all have freedom. Sorry, just before I go, Joel, it's off subject, but do you know about the progress of the Notre Dame, Notre Dame after the horrific fire? I don't, actually, um, except I think that the initial concerns about how far or how much damage um, had been done, I think it was there was less damage than they feared. But I'm, I might be wrong, and that doesn't mean that there wasn't much damage. Um, but that's interesting. No, I don't know. I was just, I was lucky. I saw Notre Dame two years, I think, before, before the fire. So, right, everybody, I shall go. Leave you to your day. Leave you to your evening. Um, wherever you are, have a great rest of your day, and I will see you all next week. Bye. <laughs>